The topic tonight, the poverty of policy, enriching the rich to help the poor. And the Great Recession represented the most severe economic contraction since the Great Depression. Nine million people lost their jobs. Ten trillion dollars of wealth melted away. 430 banks closed their doors. The millions of people who lost their homes and their retirement saw the American dream turn into a nightmare. In response, the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve provided liquidity money to the financial sector to enable them to meet their obligations. The Fed in particular came through as lender of last resort to stop the decline in asset values, preventing what Hyman Minsky called a debt deflation depression. Since the Great Depression, however, Congress has been paralyzed. Many, such as Paul Ryan, invoked the philosophy of Ayn Rand, the philosophy that selfish behavior is the path to prosperity. Aside from the role of selfish behavior in precipitating the Great Recession, Ryan overlooks the observation that Adam Smith, who championed self-interest as the basis of capitalism, also championed sympathy in checking the worst abuses of self-interest. The paralysis of Congress means that efforts to stimulate the economy have fallen to the Fed. To stimulate the economy, the Fed has resorted to quantitative easing. And quantitative easing I think I'm going I think I missed my place. Anyway. Quantitative easing means that the Fed purchases U.S. Treasury bonds, IOUs of the United States Treasury, and mortgage-backed assets in an effort to stimulate economic activity. As the Fed buys these assets, their values rise. So the Fed strategy actually takes, we are off, but that's okay, actually takes a page from Milton Friedman. And Friedman argues that the Fed's purchases of assets leave sellers of assets, primarily banks, flush with cash. The banks, in turn, loan money, which is used to purchase other assets. In this manner, the Fed increases the structure of asset prices, which supposedly trickles down to the workers. In other words, the Fed's policy of helping the helps the disadvantaged by first helping the advantage. The effect on the disadvantaged appears dubious. Unemployment is falling, but partly because people are leaving the labor force. The Fed's policy, however, has clearly benefited the bankers. If we search for an explanation beyond the Fed's policy, perhaps we can find it in the wisdom of Lloyd Blankfein, CEO of Goldman Sachs. Quote, we help companies to grow by helping them raise capital. Companies that grow create wealth. This, in turn, allows people to have jobs that create more growth and more wealth. It's a virtuous cycle. Blankfein concludes simply, quote, we're doing God's work, unquote. One would hope God finds other work. Something serviceable, perhaps carpentry. <laughs> Banks are currently sitting on $2.6 trillion of excess reserves. The profits of the financial sector as a percentage of GDP have never been higher. Investment spending on new construction, plant and equipment, and inventories collapsed following the Great Recession, largely owing to the collapse in new construction. Even so, the recovery in investment has been insufficient to provide for full employment. While asset holders have benefited, regular people have benefited little at all. Since the Great Recession, wealth inequality has increased. The top 10% of households own 85% of the wealth. The top 20%, as this graph indicates, the top 20% of households own 93% of the wealth, 
leaving 7% of the wealth to the remaining 80%. If we look at the decline in net worth from 2007 to 2013 based on the distribution of household income, we find that the bottom 20% of households saw their wealth decline by 33%. The next 20% of households, their wealth declined almost by 50%. The top 10% of households, their wealth declined only by 11%. In terms of Median income, median income declined from 55,000 in 2007 to 51,000 in 2012. Only this past year's median income began to increase again. Following the recession, virtually all the increase in real income went to the top 1%. In terms of median income, the bottom 60% of households were at the same level of income in 2010 in real terms as they were in 1986. The top 5% of income earners saw their incomes increase 43% over the same period. Now the Fed's strategy inverts the historical relationship between asset prices and income flows. The Fed has thought to stimulate the economy by increasing asset prices, resulting in a four-fold increase in the Fed's purchases since 2008 excuse me, fourfold increase in the Fed's assets since 2008. In normal markets, asset prices represent the revenues from which businesses pay their expenses and earn profits. Adam Smith's butcher, brewer, and baker did not make money selling assets. They made money selling goods. As Adam Smith noted, to make money, capital must circulate. It must go in one form and return in another. Thorstein Veblen observed, the businessman in industry realizes his gains. To realize means to convert saleable goods into money values. And to paraphrase, paraphrase the substance of Keynes' theory, for businesses to produce goods for market, there must be a market for goods. From one point of view, the economy, in fact, is really a series of mutual obligations. In purchasing a car, I promise the car dealer a sum of money. In financing the car, I receive a loan in exchange for a promise to repay the bank over a period of time at a specified interest rate. I receive the car, the dealer receives his profits, and the banker expects to profit from future interest payments. In a financial crisis, a significant portion of the economy is unable to meet its obligations. In the Great Recession, the inability of the banks and others to meet their obligations forced them to sell assets to raise cash. The collapse in asset prices pushed the economy to the verge of depression. Intervention by the Fed and the U.S. Treasury to provide money enabled the banks to fulfill their promises. The lessons learned are that providing money can prevent depression. Providing money is less effective in stimulating the economy. The reason is simple. Providing money can't create new obligations except to the Fed. Creating obligations requires expenditures. For Smith's Brewer, those obligations involve purchasing labor, barley, hops, and yeast, not to give you the recipe for beer, <laughs> financing and purchasing a brewery, hiring a brewmaster, providing containers, marketing, finding retailers, and so on. At each step, promises to, pe to provide inputs are exchanged for promises for money. Keeping those promises hinges on the sale of the final product, which generates the income flows from which to fulfill those promises. So this is where we are today. Quantitative easing is effective in, in raising asset prices. It is ineffective in stimulating economic activity. It can't force economic agents to invest, borrow, hire workers. In the meantime, the world economy remains precarious. Japan's economy contracted 1.8% in the second quarter of this year. Europe is on the verge of deflation, prompting the head of the European Central Bank to reduce interest rates below zero and call for government to increase spending. 
China is slowing down. The U.S. dollar is currently appreciating, which will hurt exports, hurt growth, and increase deflationary pressures. But it, it seems regrettable, though, for us not to, move, not to do more to help those at the bottom rung of the income ladder. People who are unemployed or, li or leaving the labor force do not contribute to economic output. They must live off their savings or from the largesse provided by the rest of us. It is bizarre that we are willing to endure the lost output, the lost income, and the silent suffering of many of these poor, many of these people whose poor self-image is often shaped by the lack of a job. Quantitative easing benefits asset holders, not those who work for a living. The result is more of the same. Increasing inequality, increasing stagnation, and a further undermining of the system itself. The CEO who reduces his labor force, reduces benefits, and cut wages may take pride in increasing the return to, sh return to stockholders. But for the economy as a whole, it raises the question, who will buy the goods? Thank you.